Gil um, came out of Caltech where he did some interesting work and was a consultant for a while, but then built a, a company called Applied Somatics, which looked at ways of reading the web very quickly and reading for content. This company was purchased by Google and um, became, in a sense, the core of the, the AdSense business, which now is worth several billion dollars a year to them, um, and has had a long-standing fascination with a kind of the machine-readable web, um, software as a kind of consumer of data, the automation of this, and now in his current company, a great interest in both data abundance and data quality, which are two huge issues. And data in a kind of continuously potential state of interacting with other data. And we'll get into the, when he's mic'd, we'll get into the, a, a little bit about what Factual is about and the long-term plans he has, ideas he has about a new type of architecture in which data is not so much a item that is entered into applications or gives information about other applications and processes, but is a distinct layer in the stack. Oh, good. Y'all boss is actual, huh? Yeah, hey. Thank you. Thank you. So, that was a somewhat superficial idea of what factual is. Why don't you talk about how you describe factual to your dad, say? That, that's, that's been a challenge that we've been working on so okay. far. Because it, it's, a data platform is something that, that we believe, over time, developers are going to find a, a critical, a fundamental tool when building applications. Um, because the, the bar that consumers have for the quality of the the results that you get back from your application, whatever, no matter what it is, the bar keeps rising and rising. You expect more and more of it. Mm -hmm. you, you, you have less and less tolerance for errors. So from the application developer standpoint, you want to integrate all information possible. Right. And so our, our job is to collect as much of it or to give you a pathway to sh make it easy for you to get the information that, that another service can offer. It's a little bit like you know, at Google they used to say, I can't remember the exact number, maybe it was a one-sixth or one-fifth of all queries are novel. We, we get queries in Google all day long we've never seen before. And in some ways, data combinations are, are, are becoming a little like that. Ways in which data can be matched is being seen in novel ways as people right. see different needs they want to address. There's, yeah, there's certainly a, a long tail of, uh, of right. interest and queries. That, yeah, and that's an interesting snapshot of where we are in this promulgation of intelligence and sensors around the world. We just had so much information. I joke during the story that what you're trying to build here is a kind of analog to the mind of God. We'd like to know everything as it changes all the time. There's some interesting issues with that. What do you see as the primary challenges in building something that really is a large-scale repository of data? Um. Yeah, you're setting the high bar when you start talking about deities. There you go. Deities. I didn't put it up to God yet. You know, we're like, that, that's an absolute, it was my joke, not right. yours. But you know, there, are, there are issues around data quality. Mm. How do you address that? that, that that's, we, we love to, to, to jump into this, uh, into this problem. And so for us, the fact that there aren't sort of standard approaches to dealing with, with quality is, is kind of what gets us so excited about um, trying to, to reinvent a few wheels. So, um, so one of our approaches is we want to look at as much information as possible. We want to, if, if we are examining a fact, we want to explore deeply uh, the provenance. We want to look at every possible place on the web and even off of the web where somebody might express an opinion. And there really is a spectrum between fact and opinion. In our, in our kind of world, neither of those words make sense because nothing is a fact, nothing is 100%, and any opinion has a silver, always has a silver lining effect. Mm -hmm. um, so we're always trying to move across the spectrum, look for more and more statistical evidence that, uh, that a set of opinions are expressing a truth. It's sort of like Hal Varian had this whole presentation on predicting, predicting the present. That's, uh, what, that's what our technology right. tries to do, is predict truth. So is, is, well, you're kind of postmodern, aren't you? Everything's always situational, right? But is the means to truth a kind of, if you can triangulate several points of view, right. you're coming closer. It's asymptotic, but you're coming closer to knowing this is a fact. Right, right. so I'm waxing a little philosophical, but the, bo okay. the bottom line is if, you, if there's a business and you want to know what sort of food they serve, 
You can look for every sentence on the web that talks about what cuisine. You can look at, at uh, online sites. Right. Um, you can look at what users are blogging about. And, and then you, the hard work is, is structuring all this data because it tends to be unstructured. So you might choose, you might learn a taxonomy of food types. And then you might see that uh, a different set are selected. Um, and then you, you collect all the information. But then there are challenges around, well, who do you trust? Uh, because sometimes a business themselves, you'd think that they would be the ones to, to trust their own home site, home page. But uh, in some cases, there are certain things businesses want to represent about themselves that are you know, a little gray. And not sure. And there's, there's an interesting challenge as you progress. I mean, you start with large publicly available data sets. And that gave you a certain level of granularity. And then as you progressed, and this has become, as I understand it, something of a policy inside the organization, you're seeking data from as many organizations as possible. And so you're requesting them to expose things that were hidden before. And the approach to them is it's actually more valuable if you expose it. Yes, we, we certainly have the, the long view of business building. And uh, so our approach has been to try to be uh, a, a, a hub in this world of data exchange. And so when somebody wants to use our data, our first question is, well, do you have anything to contribute to this data ecosystem that we're trying to be administrators of? We, we have certain verticals where we focus on, for example, this global places database, every physical named place on the planet, um, or as best as we can get to that, 60 Why million places. Why did you focus places. on places? Um, you know, I don't, I don't think it was sort of a part of the, the original inspiration. The original inspiration was to be this, this, this easy to access data mart. Uh, places was, as the smartphone was getting hot in 2009 and after we launched and we had lots and lots of data listed on our site, uh, it was just simply where we saw developers um, getting interested. Another thing that struck me was that as it, since data is kind of stative and protean, since data is always going to change and has different relationships, places is a way of forming some kind of grid on which you can place the data. Geography changes relatively slowly. So it, it gives you a schema on which to hang everything else. Yeah, the whole concept of, uh, of namespaces and IDs is quite challenging. It's, it's, it's probably the fundamental issue with data integration in general is that data in silos can be very hard to match because you're using different ways of describing entities which are ultimately the same thing. So if you want to, uh, if you have an app and you want to integrate with Yelp and Foursquare in order to do check-ins and access reviews and integrate with OpenTable. Each system uses its own ID. There's no open shared social security number for a business. Mm -hmm. And you might think that address is a good enough proxy, but it, a lot of times it's not. It's fuzzy. It's, it's messy. Um, and so that, that's, a, that's a key thing but that, that we can offer. But you still have confidence that you can get to a point where something like that is true. Mm -hmm. Well, we're, we're building our own ID, which we wouldn't mind if it becomes the universal place ID. That, that'd be fine. But we're not really forcing that on people. Uh, okay. what, what we're doing instead is we offer a product called Crosswalk, which is a map, our ID to every other ID. And then you can triangulate. So if you want to match your Yelp ID to your Foursquare ID, uh, you can kind of go through our Crosswalk and, and then and connect those mm -hmm. dots. And you've created this market of, of data, kind of currency that people can have. And that will grow. If, presuming they find value in this, yeah. that will grow. And you do arrive at this very, very broad, rich data set that you can use as a business. But even more to the point, you have this kind of intriguing idea of perhaps your company, but data more broadly, becoming a layer in the stack, which is a kind of strange architectural statement for many people. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? So I think a layer has to do with it's kind of allowing some group to specialize in something. And then as a specialist, you're either outsourcing to it or you're renting it or you're using it. And so we're seeing, seeing a lot of things move to the rent model. Today, it's very common for, uh, for startups to not have their own data center, to rent the Amazon cloud. And it's very common to, to use open source software, which nicely you don't have to rent. A lot of times you can just use. Um, or, you're, or you're buying. Um, buying packages. And so data, we think, is a next layer in the stack. And while today most enterprises aren't so comfortable with the idea of renting data, they want to control it. They think of it as an asset that they have to control, put on a data center that they control, uh, and hold on to it tightly. Uh, we think that in some cases, data can be a liability because of the costs necessary to maintain it. And if you can insert, not in all cases, there's privacy issues, but in certain cases, if you can outsource that and go with a standard 
somebody that somebody else is maintaining, that's just it's a great win-win. What's the value they receive? I mean, obviously they mm -hmm. they lower their costs, but mm -hmm. they're giving up secrets, aren't they? Perhaps. Uh, so a, a typical example would be there are sites that kind of store sort of a yellow pages. It could be a restaurant finder, and a lot of these sites like the idea of UGC. So uh, people can put in a review, or somebody can say, oh, the, the phone number of this business has changed. So now they get an edit. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's an asset, they think, initially. The, that, that's the thought. But then the question is, how do they process that? And if, they don't have an, if, if they're not experts at processing an edit, because it could be spam, it could be wrong, mm -hmm. uh, and they have to end up using some sort of human element to moderate, it ends up being very expensive. And so giving that data to, to us, uh, first of all, lowers their cost, reduces the things that they have to do, lets them yeah. focus on what, whatever it is that they are good at, maybe user experience or social networks. Right. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, as this hub, we're collecting all this noisy data from people. In aggregate, it ends up being, it ends up being valuable. And, and they gain a right to ut right. utilize other people's exposed data in right. ways that might be of value, provided they have a literacy in that. Right. This circles back to something we were saying in, in the previous panel. How well educated are they in using all these different data sets, and what can you do about that? Well, uh, luckily, there's been this rise of APIs, and so developers are comfortable with using APIs. Um, so today, whereas I think five years ago, if you're building a restaurant finder app, the obvious thing to do would be, well, the first thing I need to do is uh, I have to pick a database. You know, maybe it's MySQL because it's not super big data, or maybe if it's a lot of data, you, you go with NoSQL. Uh, now I have to buy the data and download it and manage mm -hmm. it. Uh, today, uh, strikingly, a lot of, a lot of uh, these app developers um, don't even need this core data. They just store stuff that, private things that they hang off of it. Right. So as, as this gains currency, mm -hmm. as, as it were, and this becomes a part of the stack, and data becomes a, a thing that is addressed in its own right, that also means it's subject to a lot more velocity inside the stack. And software itself becomes this kind of chronic data consumer, and the interactions of the software change the data itself. How much will that change the overall architectural environment and the world people work in? I think one thing that contributes to this really exciting velocity is that a lot of startups that consume APIs and use data and then do something interesting with it um, end up offering APIs. And the cycle of improvement, API layer upon layer, uh, I think creates this huge velocity. And so very quickly, a ton of information is becoming available you know, at all different kind of terms. So I think, mm -hmm. I think there's, a, there's this very fast feedback loop. Um, and I, so I, it's kind of like this, uh, this whole the singularity, the law of accelerate, accelerating returns. We're seeing a tremendous, if you look at the curve of APIs offered, it's kind of exponential. Um, there, there's just so many of them out there. No, I'm the one who mentions the deity, not you. <laughs> the singularity. Right. Is it, you know, at this point, you're talking about a kind of huge acceleration that is unending, or do you find this eventually writes itself and there's a, a new kind of programming environment? Um, API on API on API just goes yeah. on forever? That's a hard question. I, I guess what I'll say is, I think, so, um, so we heard uh, you know, DJ is... Uh, one of the, the most interesting and famous data scientists, and he kind of talks all about the importance of data as a tool to start a conversation and discuss things. And you know, I, that's actually absolutely a very important notion in the way companies are going to change strategy. But then there's this whole other notion, which is around automated decisions. Yes. So imagine you're driving down the, the road and the, your car starts spinning, and a voice on your computer, your car dashboard says. You're, you're going to spin. Shall we start a conversation? <laughs> That's um, right. So there's this whole other... Would you like me to buy new tires? <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's... One of the biggest issues, I think, that humanity has is where do you want to cede control to automated decision-making? Yeah. And um, I think that people... I, I, in some cases, people go kick, kicking and screaming, but I think that's the major transformation that we're, ha that we're going to see, is that computers taking the control of a lot of decisions that people just don't have the time or nearly the capability to, to analyze the data. And there, there's, a, there's room for intuition, but there's just so many cases where the computer, if it has access to the right amount of data, can just do so much better. A, a doctor, they say that a doctor on average asks for four pieces of information or checks four before making a decision. We're not far from the point where a computer system can in, in seconds 
uh, analyze your whole family's genetic history and, and, and you know, every pulse that Fitbit has ever recorded. I mean, the, the, the possibilities yes, are mind-boggling. It's certainly a lot of data, but is it going to be useful insight? So we, we don't know for sure, but everything that we see tells us that the capabilities of a machine learning system to, de to derive and see new insights and patterns that we just can't see, yeah. uh, that it always works. I'm not like you look at Kaggle, just, and yeah. there's always somebody out of nowhere that wins this competition and can do better than whatever the previous best was yeah. um, just by sharing the data. It's all about sharing the, making the data accessible. Right. That, that's why I'm so excited about making the data the accessible. Point about the, Kaggle is fundamentally a communications tool mm -hmm. among data scientists, right. you know, where one will say, I, look, look what I've done challenging the rest who thought they were at a terminus point. Now, you're a smart guy. What's something you wouldn't surrender over to software? Um, I'm What's sure that something I mean, people do better. Uh, I mean, there's probably a lot of things. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think I think there's always room now. Now, there's certainly always room for uh, vetoing the computer. There's always opportunities, especially in areas where things are happening slowly. That there's every opportunity to say, hold on a second, mm -hmm. you know, I want to get us off of autopilot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's probably um, lots of, I mean, you know, the whole emotional question of how do you sell, yeah. you know, how do you how do you attract a team, how do you build a team? I mean, a lot of it is based on emotion and a story, and I don't I don't know that that's a different. Sure. Uh, you know, I'm I'm moving into um, a kind of world two steps away when I talk about things like a data layer in the mm -hmm. stack. You're also called on to uh, advise to a lot of companies and invest in companies. What sort of things are you seeing built now that are particularly interesting? And where do you see kind of yawning needs for things to be built? Well, I get, I get very interested in, well, I've, I've learned the lesson that, that the, the best investments are the ones where you don't understand exactly, you don't necessarily need to understand exactly where the business is heading. But, but you're betting on the team. Sure. So that's one way uh, that certainly I've learned makes a ton of sense um, based on their passion and, and their, their dedication to this cause. Uh, but the other thing is I just, uh, I think fundamentally that information assets become more valuable. Um, so I get interested in, in any sort of business that is building raw assets through user-generated content or, or some sort of sensor network. When you say raw assets, you mean data sets? Mm -hmm. Right, so take an example of a company like Goodreads, um, a social network for readers that somehow has cracked this nut of how do you get people to write reviews. Uh, they, they write reviews and put them on the site at a starting, startlingly uh, high ratio compared They're to like Amazon. Ones, yeah. In a lot of cases, they have more ratings and reviews than Amazon, which kind of is, is kind of mind-boggling because it's a little still under the radar. Um, so it's, it's about how do, you, um, well, how do you incentivize people to share, how do you create a community where people are... So that, I mean, that's kind of an exciting area, mm -hmm. is, is this whole area of uh, user-generated content. What sort of tools do you think need to be built? Mm -hmm. If you could see something invented, what might it be? Um, there, I mean, there's, there's always room, there's room for improvement across the board. Um, so we'll, we'll, maybe I'll throw out the fact that uh, I've always been interested in, the, in search. You know, yeah. I got to spend a few years at Google. Um, I didn't get to work on search itself. But you know, I was always uh, just kind of in love with this notion of here's this entire crawl. It's all the web data on the world. What can you do with it? Um, there's just today um, for a startup that wants to jump into that, uh, it's not so easy. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to build a chart of uh, of how many A's are in con, um, well, you know, like the code you can you can write you can get help from. You can learn about Hadoop, and you can run these jobs on EC2. But how do you get a crawl of the data? Right. Um, so one thing I've been working on is uh, making a crawl of the data available Just through a separate crawl. through common crawl. Uh, but there's so many tools on top of that that we don't have the time to do. Well, that I'd love to see other people to do to make it easier to. For, for those who don't know yeah. about it, spend a, spend a few minutes defining what crawl, common crawl is and how it works. Uh, so it's a very it's a nonprofit with a simple mission of crawling the web and making it accessible. Uh, in a way that it hasn't been before, which is at scale. So Internet Archive is a terrific, a very important organization, but they were designed to let you access a page at a time to do research for a human. And I'm very interested in anything uh, machine-readable, and so Common Crawl makes the entire corpus 
Uh, we're up to about 10 billion pages available to download for free if you want or to process. It's sitting there on Amazon, so you could just come up with any algorithm you want. You can build a search engine. You could do an epidemiological study. Whatever it is, whatever your bright analytics idea is, there, mm -hmm. there's the data. You, is that to say that you sort of stored the web mm -hmm. on Amazon for people to, yeah. Right. We're, so first of all, we're very hey, thankful. Somebody had to do it. We're thankful. <laughs> We're thankful to Amazon for providing a tremendous amount of storage for free on their, their Amazon public data sets program. I think 99% of the storage, I think, used on Amazon public data sets is used by us. Well, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, well over, it's well over a hundred ter couple hundred terabytes, I think, now. How often do you refresh it? It's, it's a fledgling organization. We just hired some um, really st strong people. The organization's growing right now. It's about every year, but I hope that's every month okay. very soon. So essentially, it is a mirror of mm -hmm. the web that people can address mm -hmm. as if it is a, a data set. Right. What sort of stuff are you seeing people do with that? So it's just getting started. Uh, there's the group at the University of Berlin that we're extracting every, if you, if you know about semantic web, there's uh, these, these RDF tuples. They're structured relations that are stored in pages. And so they extracted every single one, uh, billions of these, in order to make it easier for someone to to process this more structured knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing some colleges use it as a learning tool um, because, well, if you want to teach, uh, if you want to teach big data and big data processing, uh, the fact that now you have Hadoop that's open sourced and, and great, you know, cloud era stacks and tutorials, that's, that's great. But then what do you practice on? What do you play with? What, where's your sandbox? Mm -hmm. And so having a lot of real world data that lets you test real world theories um, ends up being not only useful, but uh, just kind of fun and inspirational because you know you're building something that could turn into uh, real practice. Are you undermining your old employer? Um, they did give us a small donation oh. recently. Well, there so, you go. Uh, you know, I think Google wants it's it to be... It's probably also a great way to spot talent. Mm -hmm. Somebody does something interesting out there. Mm -hmm. There's that. Right. So you know, I don't think there's so much more that goes into building a search engine than just having the data. Right. So uh, certainly get somebody one step closer to, uh, to challenging Google, but you know, I, I think there, there's enough that they've built on top of it where uh, I don't think they're I, Microsoft shake, I don't has think put they're shaking. resources behind it for years. It's, yeah. it's much more like a research tool mm -hmm. in that sense. Uh, what do you think are the needs in public institutions? What should uh, academia be doing in different ways? I was speaking yesterday about you know, MIT exposing mm -hmm. 120,000 people to an, a, a double E course. Mm -hmm. Do you think that kind of global education will become a, a good model? Do you think we need to spot and train high experts? What, what, do you, what would you like to see happen? I've, I certainly am aware that there's more interest in computer science groups for, for, for data and, and analytics and, and you know, as, Hal, as Hal Varian was saying, statistics is getting sexy and so the people are getting attracted to this. You know, instead of some things that are lower, lower layers in the stack, like it might have been networking or OS. Or, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, I think that's, a, that's an exciting shift to me because I'm, you know, I'm kind of in love with this world of information. Right. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of hidden value and we need as much, there's a huge opportunity for people to, to get trained and help. You know, without, I, I don't want to get a, a sense that this is an incredibly starry-eyed future. What do you worry about where uh, privacy and surveillance are concerned in a world like this? Um, so it's how, not might, some... how might we build in safeguards? Mm -hmm. So I think so far systems, I think, have been working OK. Um, but I think that there's an issue, and there might be a disaster sometime in the future. Um, you know, I'm like everyone else. I don't read terms of service, and I, I do the best I can to understand for a given app that I install on the iPhone or Facebook, um, what rights I'm giving up. You've just surrendered in order to play Fruit Ninja. Right. Yeah. That's a good game. That's, it is a great game. But um, more broadly, do you feel that, uh, well, so, we have a kind of barbell world here. Are right. people highly empowered, or are they, are they under more surveillance and control than ever right. before, or both? So, that, so there's two things. One is people don't really feel like they have a choice right now because because Fruit Ninja is just so awesome, yeah. you know, so you don't, you know, so yeah, you can't right. really say no. Um, the other thing is you can't really understand. There's no standards in terms. There's still not standards in terms of reading a terms of service and understanding right. precisely or a privacy policy. Yeah. And so uh, one thing is I don't know if the lawyers have an incentive to do this, but what I'd like to see is, you know, why can't a privacy policy just say 
Privacy Policy 1A. It's the standard with these two exceptions. That would make it easier to read. Right. Uh, I think if we had more programmatic standards where you could say, this is the kind of, these, this is the data that I'm willing to give up to these types of companies, and then the system could decide for itself whether the privacy policy is, is kosher for you or not, um, that would be easier. And, that, that, and part of that is A about... A machine reader. Yeah, taking humans out of the decision, because we just don't have time to parse or understand the language. Or, yeah, we that just would be an time. interesting visualization. A machine reader that read a privacy policy and said, mm -hmm. here's the areas where you might be in hazard. Right. You know, here's the ways this might be recombined. So I don't know how this is going to happen, but certainly I think it would be a step forward. Um, the other thing is, do people start wanting to take more control of their information? In some cases, people's information is incredibly valuable. Uh, these services uh, monetize it. Um, I, you know, it's interesting when people say, you know, if you're using a service for free, you're not the customer, you're the product. Right. So as, as the product, well, do you want to sort of retake control? And there's some interesting companies out there that are trying to create um, personal data lockers where ultimately you're the controller of your personal information. And, and in this new world, if this works, Facebook would have to sign up to your terms of service if they want to work with you. You know, right now they have the leverage and power, so that's not right. where we are. Right. But there's interesting companies I've talked to that um, there's a locker project at Singly and Personal and and uh, Personal.com um, that I think are doing really interesting. You know, things. I was looking at the privacy policies on all the social networks recently, and I think it's kind of an accident of history. But in a way, what they really are are corporate software licenses. I think the the legal department needed a map, and they look very much like corporate software licenses where. The corporation just gets the right to tweak everything. We sell this to you, but we retain the rights to change this all the time. And it's kind of a, a fluke of history that we ended up there. It may get rewritten, but an app would be another way of coming at that. Yeah, so I think, you know, again, we, we just we accept the fact. And, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I use all these, these services, and I, and I tend to be, I'm not a naysayer. I, I believe these companies. Uh, mean well and aren't going to abuse the rights. Um, it's just, it, there's, there's just some tricky areas where there could be leakage and there's third parties that get a hold of data and you don't know exactly who they are and, and you don't exactly know who, how they're controlled. So, mm -hmm. um, so, the, so there are some challenges, I think. Mm -hmm. Who else is doing an interesting data mark? Um, so we're really, we're hoping that a lot of companies will uh, bring liquidity to data so that when you, your piece of software, in some cases a human, but in some cases a piece of software says, I have 10 milliseconds, I need this piece of information about this entity, go, that you act, this piece of software has choices and it can evaluate choices maybe in real time um, and it could do this through a data mart that says, well, here's what it costs at each of these places. Wow. And that, that will kind of create this new liquid marketplace for information. Um, I mean, the, the companies that are working on things like this include um, uh, I, think, I believe Scandinavian, Scandinavian company Data Market that's moved to San Francisco to New York, and um, Microsoft has their Azure Data Marketplace. Mm -hmm. uh, InfoChimps was in this space, so but it's still very new, and it's still not right. sort of the standard way that people are buying. You can or see the software data. developing a kind of Amazon ratings mm -hmm. of each of the data marts too for this for this right. type of query. I give it right. three stars. Service was good. Data quality was not so good. Right. And, and generally, um, data providers will go into this kicking and screaming. They don't want this concept of transparent data quality. Any data provider um, makes it very difficult. And in some cases, they don't even know themselves. If you, if you go to government data, uh, I don't think they have internal metadata around what's the likelihood that each row is correct. I don't think they're interested in talking about that. Now, I mean, if they could trace the entire provenance of where did this, the entire lineage of where, who put this information in, where did it come from, what other data was it based on. Right. And if you could look at all that metadata uh, and maybe put in your own value system. Right. So what if you could... Records of success interacting with it. You know? What if you could pick a set of IP addresses in Wikipedia that later you decide they have a different way of looking at things, they have a different value system, and you want to recreate Wikipedia as if a certain set of users or IP addresses never existed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how do you go back? I mean, the beauty of sort of these big data systems and Hadoop is that you don't have to just settle on what's my final conclusory data. I'm just going to keep updating that. You can kind of go back to, to first principles, go back to all your raw data, use something that you now learned, like I don't trust that guy, 
and then rebuild based on this new evidence. You know, I just realized you're talking about establishing something towards a fact by having many, many different reviewers look at it. And you're talking about um, the quality of data sets based on number of interactions that are successful. What you're saying effectively is truth is a product of experience. Not exactly a yeah. breakthrough, but kind of a whole new technical approach to it, really, isn't it? Yeah, I've never thought, thought of it quite that way, but I'm that, I think so. I, it's the There's experience that a, a machine is having with its learning about sources that over time it yeah. decides that it can trust. It turns out we're circling back to a human truth. Right. Any questions from the audience? Oh, God, I hit a bad note. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Um, we're starting to use financial terminology, and I'm wondering about the role of uh, arbitrage or speculation, if we're talking about an information marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, do you guys do that? Have you got a flat pricing structure, or is there uh, room for third parties to come in and start to act as market um, speculators, for instance? Mm -hmm. So our, our pricing structure for web and mobile apps that are building apps is, is flat based on um, API calls. Um, it, it, gets, it, it gets trickier, and we're still evolving our pricing model for what if you want to do in analytics where there's no uh, sort of uh, display of the data. Um, as far as arbitrage, I, certainly when marketplaces are liquid and when there are places where there's active buying and selling of information, I mean, absolutely there's going to be a companies that see opportunities to buy from here and then sell here maybe doing some sort of manipulation in the process. Um, so, I mean, we're, we're excited about the, the opportunity to, I, I, think, I think that sort of arbitrage brings efficiency, and efficiency means that everybody kind of understands what they're getting and at what price, and they're paying a fair price. I think that'll be, I'm, I'm looking forward to that future. Yes, ma'am, did you have a question? No, one of the challenges was that you um, have to decide who, which sources to trust. So how have you um, kind of mm -hmm. combated that problem? So the, the best way to do it is still involves a human element, which is to create a gold standard of data. Um, and it doesn't have to be a very large gold standard. Um, so what we'll often do is go to Mechanical Turk, get an, a lot of people to research and agree on the truth of data points on a smaller number, and then start using that to evaluate sources. We've tried to do this fully automatically, where you, we believe our, our own truth, uh, and then use that to assign truth and a reputation to others. And sometimes that can go horribly wrong if most people are right, wrong, and one person is right. So, um, you know, so, so there is certainly room for a Can you give an example? Um, of things going wrong? No, like of a fact that, that, that you evaluate as true and then... So, I, so, I mean, our, the primary database we're building is this global places database of about 65 million places. And so the kind of thing we need to do, and we're doing this in a lot of languages that we can't read, so we need people to uh, call on the phone or go to sources that they uh, believe are accurate, um, using a little bit of human judgment to kind of build this training set. Um, around, what, well, let's say phone number and address, something basic like that, or the correct spelling of the name. And then, so the, then, then we can use that to see which sources. Um, so for, for example, if a place is serving organic food, can you, can you, trust, can you trust the business's own propaganda or not? I mean, that, uh, in some cases, um, a, a particular source can be more or less trustworthy. Other questions? Hi, Gil. Um, you mentioned earlier that you'd like to see more and more decisions uh, be shifted to software and to mm -hmm. machines. Uh, beyond uh, the examples you're, you're discuss discussing in self-driving cars, things like that, what are some other like low-hanging fruit decisions that society could benefit from that were, if they were moved to uh, machines? So I mentioned uh, predictive health, which I think is going to be one of the most um, impactful ones. Uh, I'm involved with XPRIZE, and they are launching uh, a whole a tri-quarter prize to, to sense illnesses that you have based on uh, all sorts of measurements. Um, and you know, health also plays a, a large role in a, the largest Kaggle $3 million prize, which looks at 100,000 de-identified patient records and tries to predict who's about to need 
who needs preventative care for, for an oncoming issue like a heart attack or a stroke before a person might realize it themselves. So that's certainly huge. Uh, I mean, there's definitely less noble things like just helping people uh, pick a restaurant um, based on their own uh, personal tastes. And I mean, I think what's interesting is something like people starting to use Siri and ask questions about you know, what's a place nearby. And in the background, people don't know it, but they're a lot of times asking Wolfram Alpha, you know, using their APIs, and I think that's going to increase. There'll be more and more APIs factoring in, and I'm sure uh, more and more machine learning will go into that to help you to make good recommendations. Okay. I think we have time for a last question. I can't see. Other question? Okay. We've run. Oh, go. You mentioned uh, you might see a disaster in the future around, I think, was it privacy or yeah. quality of data? What's that disaster? Yeah, so I think, so I mean, I'd love to see, I think it would be immensely valuable for people to have, have everybody to have their entire personal health records uh, on the internet. Um, I don't think it would be surprising that at some point, I mean, Google had their, their and Microsoft had their products and sort of backed away from it. I, don't, I think at some point, one of these large companies, maybe Facebook, uh, will offer it. Um, the question is, um, to what degree do you have control of how third parties are accessing it? And, and can you predict which third parties will violate the contract? And then where does that information leak? Talk about an interesting terms of service issue, Fitbit you know, and mm -hmm. Nike Sport. Retain that mm -hmm. data on people. Mm -hmm. It's not clear what they're doing with it mm -hmm. or how well protected it is. Yeah, so I think it'll be revolutionary once the information's out there because I think so many lives can be saved if simply this information can be aggregated by some data scientist community. Um, I, I, I think it, it, this is to ha it has to be a conversation we start to make sure that we have the right principles in place to, yeah. to make sure that you don't have the issues that people get worried about, like somebody's insurance getting jacked up because they obtained this information illegally. Okay. Well, thank you so much. We've run over our time, but it was for a good cause. Uh, we'll have a short break now. How long are we going to? Till 11. Till 11. Okay, so let's go for coffee. Thanks so much. Thanks.